Welcome everyone to Vector Institute's Careers in AI, spotlighting applications in manufacturing and robotics with Canvas Analytics and ClearPath Robotics, two Vector industry sponsors. My name is Melissa Judd, and on behalf of everyone at Vector, thank you for spending this hour with us. And a very special thank you to our two presenters for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. The Vector Institute is funded by the Province of Ontario, the Government of Canada through the Pan-Canadian AI Strategy, administered by CIFAR, and industry sponsors from across the Canadian economy. And part of Vector's mandate is building a strong AI ecosystem in Ontario. And a significant portion of Ontario's ecosystem is small and medium-sized enterprises companies like Canvas Analytics and ClearPath Robotics. Actually, according to a 2019 report released by the federal government, in Ontario alone, SMEs make up 99% of the businesses in the province and 88% of the private sector workforce. In looking at these numbers, there is a very good chance you might find yourself working at an SME at some point in your career. And today, you'll have an opportunity to hear from two of these companies. But regardless of the size of organization that you're targeting to work post degree, if you're looking to work in AI, I would encourage you to check out the Vector Digital Talent Hub, which is a job board featuring roles across different sectors. The hub can be accessed at talenthub.vectorinstitute.ai. And if you haven't already done so, you can create a profile on the Talent Hub, which takes less than five minutes to do and browse a curated set of internship and full-time opportunities, as well as set up automated alerts to be notified when particular types of roles that you're specifically interested come up. In fact, at this time, there is an opportunity posted at ClearPath for an autonomy engineer perception, which I believe is part of our first presenter's team. But before I introduce our first presenter, I did want to remind everyone that today's session is being recorded and there will be an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers after each of their project presentations through the Q&A function in Zoom and during the fireside chat after our uh, presentations conclude. So at this time, please allow me to introduce our first speaker, James Servos. Autonomy Engineering Manager Perception at ClearPath. James is a proud alumnus of the University of Waterloo, where he completed his Bachelor in Applied Science and Engineering and his Master of Applied Science with the Waterloo Autonomous Vehicles Lab. James has 10 plus years experience developing perception technologies for self-driving vehicles and has authored over a dozen publications, including academic papers and patents. James also serves on the Steering and Scientific Review Committee for the NSERC Canadian Robotics Network. Please join me in welcoming James. Thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is uh, James Servos and I am the uh, Autonomy Engineering Manager for the Perception Group at ClearPath Robotics. And I'm excited to be here and talking to you, all of you about uh, what we do at ClearPath as well as some of the challenges and uh, opportunities that we have in, in AI for, for mobile robotics. Um, so first I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about the company. So ClearPath is actually divided into two divisions, uh, the ClearPath Robotics Division and the Automotive Division with their respective brands. Uh, many of you in academia might be familiar with our ClearPath Robotics uh, brand with our iconic yellow and black research ro robots uh, that we provide as uh, platforms for researchers to develop uh, their robotic algorithms on. Um, However, in 2015, uh, to support the growing need for industrial robotics, uh, we spun out the uh, Automotors Group, which focuses on material handling robots for industry. So as I said, uh, ClearPath Robotics uh, does a lot of interesting work, uh, mainly focused on creating robust platforms for mobile robotics research. Um, and these platforms come in a variety of sizes. You know, we have our Jackal robot, which is the smallest version, all the way up to our eight-wheeled large vehicle uh, Moose, um, that can, can serve as uh, service any, any number of, of research applications. We also provide uh, customization services, whether it's mounting arms, new sensors, new hardware, uh, as well as uh, software packages for 
researchers to use, such as uh, waypoint navigation and virtual teach and repeat. Uh, researchers really want to focus on on their research and not have to deal with the, the the complications of developing entire robot platforms and the entire robot software stack. So we allow researchers to really focus on on their research and leave uh, all the rest of it to us. Um, and we provide these services to them. Um, on the other hand, Automotors, um, our newer division, uh, creates uh, fully autonomous infrastructure-free mobile robotics for industrial materials transport. So what this means is that they uh, are used to transport goods um, and materials around uh, factories, warehouses, distribution centers. Uh, they're used in a variety of different uh, applications and industries such as automotive, industrials, uh, retail distribution centers, and aerospace. Uh, we have two main product lines. Uh, we have the Auto 1500, which you see on the left, that's our large platform, and it's used for heavy duty industrial transports, um, usually replacing what would normally be done by large uh, heavy, heavy machinery, such as forklifts. And we have our smaller platform, the Auto 100, which you see on the right, and, and that's used for um, lighter payloads in tighter spaces, uh, such as at distribution centers and going down aisles, uh, such as in warehouses. Um, and they really cover, uh, a wide variety of applications and we, we add customizations to the top to do um, interface with various material handling operations such as uh, you can see across the top lifts, arms, conveyor belts, carts, uh, really anything that, that we need to, to make these robots uh, useful in, in the industry setting. So really why does, why does the industry want mobile robots? So there's, there's a lot of reasons but a recent survey uh, highlighted four. Um, the first being that there's a labor shortage. Uh, there simply aren't enough uh, people to fill these sort of jobs in, in these manufacturing and, and industrial settings. So we supplement them with, with these robot and automation uh, abilities so that these industries can continue to grow and really prosper uh, in this labor shortage market that we're seeing. Uh, the second one is obviously safety. Safety is a huge consideration in industry. Um, human error accounts for a lot of uh, accidents in, in the industrial setting and robots ha have been found to be much safer uh, than their human counterparts. Uh, the digital transformation, everyone always wants to have more data about what's going on in their industry, where the goods are in their factory, and, and incorporating automation into your facilities allows you to, to really leverage uh, a lot of extra, all that data that you have. Uh, and, and finally, flexibility. As we've seen in, in kind of this um, modern day where uh, things can change at the drop of a hat. Having the flexibility to reorganize your uh, facility, to really uh, start new product lines, new assembly lines, uh, it gives you a lot of uh, opportunity that, that you wouldn't have with traditional automation technologies. Um, specifically, uh, talking about our automotors fleet, um, it's growing every day. We currently have over 90 active sites globally uh, where our robots are uh, online and, and producing uh, useful work. Our robots uh, drive the equivalent of 25 laps around the world every year. Um, so we have lots of self-driving experience um, of these robots in many different environments and always, always on the road. Uh, and finally, we complete over 400,000 missions uh, every month. Uh, missions providing useful uh, effort and work for, for the variety of industries that, that we find that our, our robots are performing in. Um, but let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what is actually inside some of these systems. Um, so the auto robots are, are very complex, uh, intelligent robot uh, machines. Uh, they rely on dozens of interconnected systems that all work together to really make intelligent decisions about where they're going, where they are, uh, and perform tasks that are uh, normally for, performed by, by human operators. Um, personally, as uh, was mentioned, I'm uh, a part of the perception team. Uh, so we focus on the perception uh, components. And even within the perception group, there is a wide range of, of different components that, that need to come together in order to make a truly autonomous and intelligent vehicle. Um, some of listed here, dynamic obstacle tracking, localization, mapping, calibration, target tracking, um, are just some of, of the, the wide range that we need to incorporate together. And all these technologies have to work together with the other teams uh, to really uh, make, make a vehicle that's capable of, of performing useful work. Um, but what about AI? 
Uh, we're here to talk about AI. So the definition of AI has really become a little murky over the years, uh, particularly once the mainstream media got their hands on it. Um, but at, at its core, it's, it's any system capable of performing tasks that are normally require human intelligence. And that is exactly what we're making at, at Auto. We're making a, a robot that performs a task, which is material transport and navigation throughout a industrial facility uh, that would normally be performed by a human operator, uh, either driving a forklift or pushing a cart. So really we, we, are, the, we are the definition. Um, many of our subcomponents, such as sem semantic segmentation among many others, also incorporate aspects of AI, uh, but really it's the, the overall system that comes together that is truly capable of making those intelligent decisions and, and performing effectively. Um, however, many people uh, assume that AI and machine learning are, are synonyms. Uh, I'm personally not, not one of those people. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think machine learning is a very powerful tool in our, in our AI toolbox that we use to, to create these AI systems. But I think that it's only one of, of, one of many. So when we start talking about that, we're, we're talking about model-based methods versus machine learning. Um, model-based methods are still uh, very, very common in uh, many, many areas. Uh, they have many new, many strengths that, that have not been fully replaced by the machine learning community. Uh, one of the most common examples is SLAM. Uh, SLAM is, uh, the state of the art SLAM methods still rely heavily on our model-based uh, systems. Uh, however, we are starting to incorporate some machine learning technologies. Uh, on the other hand, we do uh, incorporate machine learning. Uh, it's been proven to be a very powerful method, very powerful technique. It's revolutionized certain fields such as computer vision, object detection, classification. Um, so it's really the union of the two methods and, and philosophies that I think is, is the, really the powerful combination that, that can truly generate um, useful machines that, that can achieve intelligence. Um, but there are, are many challenges in, in developing these machines and to overcome some of those challenges, we, we have to combine these methods and, and use many many techniques. Um, some of those challenges include uh, safety and reliability, which is really one of the biggest challenges in, in mobile robotics. Uh, safety is, is an obvious one, I think. Um, these are large physical machines that are carrying heavy payloads, often traveling at, at high speeds. And if we don't handle them accordingly, uh, we can obviously get into some hazardous situations. Um, reliability goes hand in hand with, with safety. Uh, we're we're performing critical tasks for industry uh, and we don't want to cause any disruptions to the production line or to the distribution center. So any downtime can be uh, a real problem and unacceptable in, in most industri industry applications. So AI gives us obviously a much better understanding of um, the environment around us and allows us to make more informed decisions about, about really what we're doing and, and try to maintain a safe operation. However, uh, because of the complexity of a lot of these AI systems. System failures can be very difficult to predict and they can be very difficult to understand, especially for non-expert users. Particularly machine learning, as we all know, um, failures in, in your neural network can be very complicated to debug and very hard to understand at times, which is why uh, areas of research such as explainability uh, is a really important thing that many researchers are, are looking at. and enabling us to understand why these systems uh, do what they do. Um, and uncertainty estimation, basically allowing us to better understand how certain the system is about what it's doing and what its output is. Uh, because really knowing or guaranteeing safety is, is crucial. And if we don't fully understand the systems we're using, we can't guarantee that safety. And in a lot of cases, we have to rely on hardware uh, safety systems uh, on many of these robots currently, uh, but, but those hurt our efficiency and, and our productivity. Uh, so really we wanna be able to de develop truly reliable and robust and safe uh, AI systems. Um, from a practical perspective, uh, that can come down to a lot of factors, but one that we often use is uh, redundancy. So in, in the bottom left image here, you can see that we're using both a model-based and a machine learning-based approach combined together to, to be able to produce an output that is more reliable than each would be on its own. Um, overall, 
in, in industry applications, it means that the, the bar and the expectation for reliability is much higher than what you would expect in, in some of these other places that machine learning is being used. Um, for example, if, you're, if your Google search returns a bad result, it's probably not a big deal. If your robot decides that a person is actually traversable ground, uh, then you might start having some serious problems. So really, we need to make sure that we're making systems that, that are really in that 99.9 .9 repeating level of, of reliability and, and accuracy. However, some of the uh, areas that uh, machine learning can really excel is in, in generalization and adaptability. So our, our vehicles work in a very diverse set of environments, as you can see on the left, uh, manufacturing versus warehousing versus distribution all, all look very differently. Uh, even between manufacturing facilities, you might know, find a completely different set of machinery, completely different set of what, what the facility looks like. So making systems that are able to adapt and generalize to all these different uh, environmental conditions while still being able to perform the fundamental tasks that we, we design them to make, it is very important. And machine learning is an excellent technique that, that allows us to do that and solve some of these problems for, uh, for problems that are very difficult to model, including semantic segmentation. Um, but one of the big things that we find is that in order to achieve this result, um, we need data. We need a lot of data. And big data is a big problem, as I like to say, uh, because you need quality data that will determine the quality of your final product. And I, I also find that students often don't appreciate the data that they, that they have. They just go online and they download a data set and they're off to the races. But in, in real world problems, you can't just download your data from the internet. You have to, you have to get it, you have to make it. Um, and developing these data sets is, is a challenge in itself. And we've even, in fact, new areas of computer science have been developed just to focus on these problems. Um, and when we incorporate robotics into the mix, it becomes even more challenging because we need to, to have a, a real robot in a real situation, uh, collecting real examples. Uh, we have to do sensor calibration, synchronization, and e even recording and compression becomes challenging when you're working on an embedded platform. Uh, and it, it has to be sustainable. So we have to be able to, to always collect new data in case the robot inevitably makes a mistake and, and we have to try and fix it. So the data, is king, as, as they say in, the, in the, the, AI, the AI world. So in conclusion, um, mobile robotics is really a really exciting field. It's lever leveraging a massively diverse set of technologies uh, that are on the cutting edge of, of intelligent, intelligent systems. And I think we're only really hitting the, the, the beginning of how AI is gonna affect industry and, and be adopted into these new, new technologies. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about what we do at ClearPath or looking at uh, some of the open positions that we have available, uh, please go and uh, look at our website um, where we have that, that posted. And we're always happy, happy to chat with new and upcoming roboticists. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, uh, James. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, your, your graphics are, are really cool. And um, it was just a really insightful talk that you gave. We do have um, a few questions from the audience. Um, at this time, I think we're going to stick with the three that we have in queue um, so that we leave time at the end for further conversation um, and our second presentation. So one question is about data and coordinates and how they're fed into uh, the robotic systems. How, you know, what, what is fed in um, as a one-time task? What is self-learned uh, by, the, by the robot as it moves through its environment? So there's, there's a lot of aspects to that question. There's a lot of different, different data. So from the top level, um, at the fleet management level, we're, we're coordinating with, with most facilities that have uh, facility management systems that, that know what's kind of going on in their assembly process. Uh, so we integrate with those to collect the data about what needs to get moved where, and our fleet management decides uh, what robot gets assigned to what, what activity. The robots, at the robots themselves level, uh, there's a wide variety of sensors on the robots, including LIDARs, cameras, IMUs, um, those kind of uh, external sensors that, that let them map and experience their environment. Um, so from that perspective, they, they are learning what's around them at all times and, and trying to keep, 
keep an up-to-date map about where they are and where they're going and what paths are available to them. Um, and then, yeah, I, I hope I answered the question. That's fantastic. So um, our second question is actually um, three questions. Uh, so first of all, how does your redundancy scheme work? Are your model-based perception methods used as second line, or do you combine the ML and the MB pipeline? So I, I'll answer the first one. So redundancy uh, is used in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, you can have a system that runs both a machine learning model and a uh, model-based model um, at the same time, and then compares the output. And then you have a, a some sort of filter at the end that compares the outputs. Uh, you could either combine them together uh, into a filtered output, or you could uh, decide which one is is more correct than the other, um, and just pick that one. Uh, usually, you you want at least three. In, in an ideal case, you'd have three redundant sensing systems um, so that you can d determine what the outliers are. Um, and then merge them together. Uh, in other cases, uh, kind of following on to your second question, uh, you do a more integrated approach. So um, maybe your your model-based method is integrated more tightly with your machine learning method. In this example of SLAM, uh, you might be using machine learning to do a front do front end loop closures, uh, place recognition type things, or well, your back end is using a graph optimization model-based method. Um, so you can combine them together in that kind of way. Um, or you can feed feed forward uh, where you're feeding the results of one into the next to, to give it a better estimate of uh, an initial condition. So there's lots of ways to do it. Um, and it really depends on what, what task you're trying to achieve. Fantastic. So this is our final question uh, for you at this time anyway. Uh, for perception in industrial environments in particular, what are some of the most important open problems that need to be tackled? I think generalization is, is the big one that I, I talked about a little bit. Um, you can go into, go into one site and it'll look completely different than a different site. For example, a site that's doing you know, manufacturing iPhones is gonna look very different than a site manufacturing cars. And having models and uh, technologies that allow you to use the same robot in both spaces without having to relearn anything or retune any of the parameters is very challenging um, and, and is not, not an easy problem um, to solve. The other big one is those sites have a tendency to change over time. Um, people start moving stuff around, they might rearrange how things look, uh, and you have to be able to adapt to that on the fly at that point um, and understand how, how the world is changing around you. So it's really uh, getting, getting a better semantic and intelligent understanding of, of what the world is around you. Fantastic, James. Thank you so much um, for your insights and your presentation. Uh, we'll have more time with James uh, during our fireside chat uh, after we finish the second presentation and Q&A.